Now we move on to our second keynote lecture, this time from Tom Scott. Uh, Tom Scott bodges things together with video editing tools, lines of code, and meters of network cable. 700,000 people subscribe to him on YouTube for videos about science, technology, and interesting things in the world. As a speaker and event host MC, uh, Tom's knowledge, sense of humour and thought-provoking style means he's spoken at the Eurovision TV Summit in Switzerland, uh, every thinking digital since 2009, and to the Conference on Parliament and the Internet. Tom once interviewed Edward Snowden via video link, asked an inappropriate question, and learned that, yes, Snowden does bother to wear trousers even when it's only in a head and shoulders in the camera shots. Uh, <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom Scott! So I've just learned that my, uh, my speaking agent sent through my bio for this one, so that's good. Um, yeah, hello. My name is Tom Scott, and um, when I was younger, although uh, still old enough that I should have known better, I sent one of the most harsh messages that I've ever sent in my life. And I'm not proud of it, but I'm going to share part of it with you. I've blocked you everywhere else, and now I'm going to block you here too. My only regret is that I can't block you in real life. <laughs> Younger me was a dick. <laughs> I couldn't block them in real life, because I'll still see them walking around, right? They're still going to get invited to roughly the same events. They're still going to be in the same kind of circles. And it's going to be awkward, particularly after I send a message like that. <laughs> and some folks would say that uh, I should just make peace with the fact that some people disagree with others, that uh, some personalities clash, that some people are jerks. But then I thought, what if we use technology instead? <laughs> so here's my proposal. Let's block people in real life. <laughs> now, OK, the technology is not here yet, right? Science fiction has talked about this for a long, long time. And it's generally shown as, as fuzzing someone out. But that just wouldn't work, even if you have some form of smart contact lenses, and even if the other person does too, that's not useful. There's still a big grey block there. You still know they're there, and a big grey block of mosaic can still <laughs> punch you in the face. But there is already a better algorithm than this. There is content-aware fill, which is what Photoshop uses to subtly remove an object from a photograph, right? I was in that photo originally. That's, that's the original, just there. But now it's trivial to just track an object, build a mask around it, and paint it out. And that first shot, you didn't notice the doubled up bush in the middle there, looks perfectly natural. And Facebook does facial recognition already, okay? That's a photo of me and some friends. It could do that for photos. It could track based on a face. Could even probably do this for video about now. Although there is the problem that without enough data around it, it does tend <laughs> to get a little bit Cronenberg. It's not, it's not great, but in the next few decades, we are going to see large amounts of technology that is getting better and better at interfacing with the mind. Because to start off with, I mean, the technology is going to help an increasingly aging population deal with senescence. We've been using deep brain stimulation to help with tremors from diseases like Parkinson's for decades. That, uh, that paper is from 2006. And uh, spoiler, or as, as we call it here, abstract. <laughs> It works. And we've already got people controlling robot arms with brain implants and exoskeletons with EEG caps. Now, of course, no one is, is working on a neural lace yet. Oh, no, wait, of course, Elon Musk is working on a neural lace. Because Elon Musk is working on everything that EMM Banks ever wrote about. So, so let's say it works. Let's say that we get brain-computer connections that roll out to the population at large over the next century. Things that actually get into the structure of the brain. I'm willing to bet that most of humanity won't descend into virtual worlds or endless stimulation, because virtual reality still won't be popular for anything other than kind of gimmicky and clunky games. People still have to work. People still have to exist in the real world and have real interactions. And, OK, so visually, the uncanny valley has pretty much been solved now, right? That's from the latest Pirates of the Caribbean trailer. That's, that's young Johnny Depp there being played by Johnny Depp. And every Disney film lately, every live action one, has got some incredible rejuvenated actor. But I'll bet there's a similar uncanny valley problem for human interactions, right? You can't simulate a human personality 
without simulating something that's pretty close to human, and that would be unethical even if it was possible, although I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg will try at some point. <laughs> but you could hijack the vision center. You could teleport to a, a remote office by telling your implant you want to go there, and you'd be edited in to the perceptions of people who are there, and your own vision would be replaced with what you'd see. Sure, it's not going to be perfect, but as oil gets more and more expensive and flight prices go up, that's going to be a hell of a lot better than a teleconference. But if you can edit people into places, you can probably edit them out as well. You could block people or things. They just cease to exist for you, and you'd cease to exist for them, quietly edited out of each other's worlds. And those implants, those implants could use the same sort of hacks that your brain uses itself to quietly and subtly skip over things that you don't care about, or stop memories from forming, or quietly root past an obstacle without even seeing it. If you walked here like this, then congratulations because your brain used all those hacks already to make sure you didn't bump into anyone on the way. You didn't notice the bin, but you just quietly walked around it. And by the time we get to this, someone who doesn't have an implant will look a little bit weird anyway, same as someone without a smartphone does now, right? And increasingly, they'll be lost in a twilight zone where they can't really get anyone else's attention. And sure, sure, there will occasionally be unsolvable clashes. There'll be bits of human ingenuity that get past all the systems. <laughs> Cost me a lot of money to get that photo made. <laughs> But in general, like, people will be okay with this, right? Because blocking someone isn't massively offensive. You won't be notified of it. And besides, who notices when someone quietly vanishes? No one here could tell me who the last person to unfriend them on Facebook was, because you weren't notified of it, and it just means that annoying person has stopped showing up in your stream. So once we're happy with that, the technology will keep getting better and better and better. People will start sharing block lists. Algorithms will get developed so that you can block things subconsciously, automatically, based on whatever your mind flinches away from. People, shops, homes, whole cities, all subtly edited out of each other's perceptions from anyone who's on the other side of a virtual wall, all sorted by, by mass consensus. And, okay, China Mavel sort of talked about this in, in The City in the City, but his two worlds only ignored each other through etiquette and tradition and occasionally violent enforcement. <laughs> Tourists just had to fit in. There'd be no need for that. It'd all be done for you right away. Rather than go to war, feuding nations can just block each other. <laughs> right? Their, their citizens' implants can just be legally mandated to edit out Russia. <laughs> Even that won't solve the Middle East crisis, but it will at least make it a bit quieter for everyone next door. Imagine separate crowds of people all walking down the same street, all slipping past each other by mutual, unknown, unspoken agreement mediated by implant. And maybe in some places, until you're an adult, you won't even get told that the other worlds exist. Before that, it's just a, a rumour between children. It's an explanation for ghost stories and things that go bump in the night. Some people might switch their implant settings and, and visit another world to see what it's like. I'm willing to bet no one's going to do that more than once. And I could look out at a full auditorium, like I'm doing now, and, but... I wouldn't know if that's true. I wouldn't know if my eyes are gliding over the people from another world. And, and someone else could be giving a talk at the same time on the same stage, and you would just quietly edit them out, and I would just walk and talk around them. They'll say that there are people out there who've blocked everyone, and we'll never know. But there are going to be some people out there who hate the idea of implants. And, and sure, they've had to get them for work, or maybe they were just assigned one that, when they were a child. But the idea doesn't sit well with them. The idea that what's coming into their head isn't the true reality isn't something they want to acknowledge. So what happens if implants edit out the idea of implants from people who have them? <laughs> and how would that be any different from sitting in this room right now, immediately dismissing all this as science fiction? All right? I think you're all paying attention to me, and you think I'm giving a talk, but who knows? <laughs> On, ignore that itch behind your left ear. It's, it's probably nothing. <laughs> my name's Tom Scott. Have a good night. <laughs>